Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Today's guest is Robert Mock, the Executive Director of Operations for Littleton Regional Healthcare and the New Hampshire Regent for the American College of Healthcare Executives. Robert has had a fascinating career starting out as an air traffic controller for the U.S. Marine Corps, then transitioning to healthcare initially as a radiology technician and working his way up into the executive ranks by, as he puts it, putting his hand up. In the podcast, Robert talks about his career, then shares some thoughts about his role as regent and why ACHE is an important organization for an early careerist to consider becoming a member of. Welcome to The Forge, Robert. Thank you. Happy to be here. So is it true that once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine? That is a true statement. I truly believe that, yeah. All right. So you enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1987, and you served until 1992. What drew you to the Marines, and, and what did you do while you were in the service? So I, th- I think I got interested in the Marines in high school. I, I really associated with their sense of esprit de corps, you know, which means, you know, always faithful. Mm-hmm. So that really that really drew drew me into, uh, you know, getting interested in that. When I went into Marine Corps, I originally, <laughs> I wanted to be a tank driver, and they had no openings. So I, my dad always said, well, well, do something in the Marines that you can come out and get a job. So I said, well, air traffic control sounds good. And yeah. that's how I got involved wow. in that. Yeah. Okay. So, so you... Not healthcare. Not healthcare, not at all. No. Yeah, yeah. Farthest thing from my mind probably back as an 18-year-old kid. Okay, so yeah. what do you do as an air traffic controller in, in the Marine Corps? So I was, uh, I was stationed in Beaufort, South Carolina the majority of my time. Went to school in Memphis, Tennessee okay. at the air tra- Naval Air Traffic Control Base there. Mm-hmm. And we control airplanes. I mean, I was up in the tower, you know, talking wow. to airplanes, landing them. It was a great job in the Marine yeah. Corps. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Really loved it. Okay. Well, what did you learn in your time in the Marines that you, th- when you look back, has influenced your, your future career? I think the thing that the Marine Corps taught me was leadership, to be okay. really honest with you. I will tell anyone to this day that I've learned more about leadership in the Marine Corps than, than any book can teach you, you know, or any, any class I took over my educational career. It teaches you how to be a leader. Okay. Can you give an example of, of something you learned or an experience? Well, I just think, I think they do a good job at you know, start, you know, listen, starting you out at, at a lower rank and, and teaching you progressively, you know, giving you more and more responsibility to where you're on a platform where you can stand up and, and give direction and, and be helpful and, and mentor younger Marines. You know, I think they give you that platform and I think they do a really good job at it. All right. So you left in 1992. What did you do in between there and when you came in 1997, you started working at Bradley Memorial? So, so between, between 92 and 97, what were you up to? Yeah, so in 1992, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I worked a lot of different jobs. Construction for a while. I worked at a company called ITS, cleaning airplanes down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Okay. Moved all over the country, doing odd jobs here and there. I ended up having a GI Bill, you know, after okay. my time in the Marines, so I knew I wanted to continue my education. My wife's family needed some help, so we ended up moving back up into Vermont where I actually, in 1995, uh, I was sitting down reading the paper, opened the paper, saw that the x-ray school there that was a hospital-based program had just graduated a class, um, and they were looking for applicants for their next class. So I'm like, well, x-ray sounds like a good career. Let's head that way. Yeah. So that's what I did. So 97, I I graduated x-ray school. It was a two-year program. Okay. And uh, uh, after that, we ended up moving down to to Cleveland, Tennessee, where Bradley Memorial is. All right. So you actually did... Your training, was it at Rutland Regional? It was at Rutland, yeah. It's a hospital-based program, which uh, back then, you don't see too many hospital-based x-ray programs anymore. There are still a few out there, but very few. The advantage that I found is that going through a hospital-based program, you still get the education component to uh, take your registry and become an x-ray tech, but you get a lot more clinical experience than a traditional hospital or a traditional college-based program. Okay. um, Because at the hospital, you're always at the hospital. So 
you were there taking x-rays all day long. You know, you'd have, out of an eight-hour day, you'd had two hours of classes, six hours of taking x-rays. So, so, so you're yeah. pretty competent by the time you come out of that. Yeah, I think so. I, th yeah. I think that's, that's um, in my career as an, as an x-ray director, I, I would tell you that's what I've found is people coming out of a hospital-based program are more ready to work right away, um, where people coming out of a college-based program require some additional training. And so that was your first experience in healthcare, was just this kind of, hey, that sounds interesting, let me give that a try. Yeah, really strange, right? No, yeah, I mean, no, well, strange congruence of events. Yeah. It's just happened, I picked up the paper that day, yeah. which, which led to my healthcare career. Yeah. Wow, okay, so so like, like we were saying, you then got a job at Bradley Memorial Hospital as a radiology team leader. I did. Yeah. Did you did you start out as a team leader? Or did you go down as a tech first? No. You know, as as you're starting out in your healthcare career, you take the first job that's open to you. Okay. I started working midnights. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the job they had open. Took a job working midnights with one other tech, who, as a matter of fact, was in the army. Okay. Um, yeah, he taught me a great deal. Uh, and here again, when the second shift team leader job came open, I raised my hand and right. uh, I got that job. All right. Yeah. So. Going to Cleveland, Tennessee was just kind of that was just that was the first job that was available. Yeah, so we we reasonable. had had so, yeah we had we had some family that lived down there, and we had actually it was funny. So my last year of school, maybe six six months left in my radiology program, we had taken a vacation down there, uh, staying with some family, and I just kind of made some trips to the hospitals around there and and asked to talk to some people. Said, hey, I'm graduating in six months, might be interested in coming down here, and Bradley called and said, hey, yeah, we'd like you to come down. So. It's how we moved down to Tennessee. Okay. So you spent th three years uh, down in Cleveland. Yes. And then you left Tennessee and moved to back to Rutland, Vermont then. Yeah, so strange. Was down in Cleveland for three years and still had plenty of friends up in the Rutland area, people I'd trained with, people who mentored me with an x-ray. And they called, called me one day and said, hey, what would you think about moving back to Rutland? We're looking for, for a CT tech. And I said, well, I don't know, but let me talk to my wife about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we decided to move back up to Rutland. Here again, they just kind of called out of the blue yeah. saying, hey, you know, you were a great student. We'd like to have you back. Okay. So moved back as a CT tech. We did. Yeah. And, but by the time you, by the time you finished at Rutland, though, you were the assistant radiology director? So I was. I was. Here again, that's, it comes back to raising your hand when people are looking for, for, for people. So I went back as a CT tech. Worked that for a year, maybe a year and a half, I would guess. The x-ray director at that time left, and they had actually, Rutland had hired a lab person to kind of run x-ray. She had no x-ray experience, so they were looking for an assistant director to kind of help her out with, you know, rules of the road of radiology, I guess right. I would say. Because okay. she, you know, within healthcare, we always say, you know, you speak your own language. And, and a lab person did not speak x-ray language. So they needed somebody to help her out and... Uh, here again, I raised my hand and I yeah. uh, got the assistant uh, director's position there. Okay, yeah. great. So these two facilities were, were fairly large facilities, is that correct? That, that's a true statement. Bradley was probably 220 beds. Rutland, uh, I think, is about 170 beds. Okay. Yep. Right. So busy places? Very busy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good places to get experience early on. That, that's really the key to it, yeah. Yeah. All right. So tell us a little bit about your role as the assistant director at Rutland, what, what, what were the kind of responsibilities that you were uh, engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, as the assistant director, I was um, uh, really there to um, lead the staff, the x-ray the X -ray staff. They, they kind of separated roles at Rutland. They had administrative staff within, within Rutland, which were uh, the secretaries, the transcriptionists, the file room clerks. They reported to one manager, and then all the x-ray techs reported to me. So they kind of separated that role out. I was also in charge of help formulate budgets, capital budgets, timekeeping, a lot of roles, um, but really managing the x-ray staff of the radiology department was my main responsibility. What, what kind of leadership challenges do you think you face in the radiology department that might be a little different than, say, other parts of the hospital? <clears throat> um, What's unique about managing radiology, let's say? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I believe people are people, you know, okay. and people want to be treated with respect and dignity, okay. no matter what part of the organization they're in. The little quirk with radiology is I, I think of radiology people of uh, as the uh, arti artist of, of the healthcare continuum right so you know you are faced with 
challenging cases, you have to then go take images of somebody's broken bone or something. And I know I need to get three views of this particular body part. Now, how am I going to do that when somebody's on a backboard, you know, got uh, a broken arm and a broken leg, but I still got to get these views. So I, it's kind of about thinking outside the box a lot and going, I know I need to do this. How do I get there? So I think of radiology people as kind of the artists of, of, of a healthcare organization, which comes with its own set of challenges because they're, they're free thinkers. Okay. You know, so it so attracts a certain kind of It does, of absolutely. After, after yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, radiology people get, get, get to play with a lot of fancy toys, um, which is fun. Yeah. But yeah, it, you know, I always think of people as they're, they're free thinkers, which, you know, has its own challenges, right? Right, right. And getting, getting all of them to march in the same direction, you know? <laughs> okay. So during your time at Rutland, you also completed your bachelor's degree in healthcare administration. So this, this is kind of goes in flow of, of your formal education is a bit non-traditional. You, you started, you went straight from high school into the Marine Corps. You did your um, certificate uh, uh, and then you finish off your bachelor's degree. Uh, it's a pattern I've seen with a lot of folks who kind of do the, the, that makes some of the choices that you made, like going into the military directly from high school. Uh, why did you decide at that point to earn the degree? Why did you decide, hey, I want to do healthcare administration as my degree? Well, I think, I think it, it, it's just a natural progression of getting older, yeah. looking down the road and saying, what do I want to do with my life? Um, now, coming out of the Marines, listen, I was, I was an older than average learner. You know, I think I got out of there when I was 23 and then, you know, the couple years in there. So, you know, it was really just about, I really like working in healthcare. It's, it's about taking care of people. And, and here again, back as an 18 year old kid, I would have said never in my wildest dreams, but, but going to x-ray school, dealing with patients, trying to help them. I found it was my calling. Okay. So at this, this is the point where you really said, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Okay. Back when I decided to go to x-ray school, it was something to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't, you know, hey, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life maybe, but it yeah. was, it was something. And once you get on and get in the field, I said, boy, helping people is really maybe what I was meant to do. Yeah. So I decided, listen, as the assistant director at, at Rutland, um, I said, I think this is, this is what I want my career to be. And how do I then move up the ranks? And that comes with education. Yeah. So it was time to go back to school and, and start learning. Did you have a mentor at this point? Anybody kind of helping you like look through like, okay, I, I think I want to commit to a future in healthcare. What do I need to do? I, I will tell you, I, I not in the healthcare field so much, but I okay. would tell you my wife pushed me yeah. to do this. It just, um, so if you want to call my wife a mentor, I'm okay with that. Okay. She was, she was thinking big picture for me at times, yeah. you know, instead of saying, listen, you're, you're meant for more than just being an x-ray tech. You, 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 you have this in you, you know, I can see the fire in you. And I would tell you, she's the one who really pushed me to continue with my education. Good for her. Kind of a nice good story. Yeah, yeah, that is a nice story. You know, yeah. It's good to have a partner that, Absolutely. that, that sees something. And, yeah. That's awesome. So you stayed till 2003 when you actually moved over to Littleton and Littleton Regional Healthcare to be the Director of Diagnostic Imaging Services. And that's where we are today and where you are today. Yes. What made you decide to make the jump to Littleton at that point? Well, there were some changes happening at Rutland. I thought in 03, I had been at Rutland for three years. I was ready to take my next step in my, in my career path, and I thought I was ready for a radiology director's job. The lab manager uh, slash radiology manager which was still at Rutland, was doing a great job, but she wasn't going anywhere anytime fast, right? I had had a discussion with the vice president there and said, you know, what are, what are plans here? And he said, you know, plans aren't going to change. And, and listen, I, I appreciate that. At least he was honest with me. And I said, okay, well, I, I need to start making some decision about my future. And he was, he was supportive of that. I just happened to see this job in one of the trade magazines. So I applied okay. and uh, I got an interview and I, I fell in love with the place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for listeners who are not familiar with New Hampshire, can you give us a quick sketch of Littleton, kind of where it is, what the community is like, and why did you fall in love with it? Sure. So L Littleton is uh, in northern New Hampshire, um, north of the Notch. If you know anything about New Hampshire, New Hampshire is kind of separated into the north and south by a mountainous region called the Notch. Um, north of the Notch, the population dwindles. It's, it's not as built up as southern New Hampshire, which has some cities. It's very rural. Littleton has been voted for several years uh, one of the top 10 best towns in, in the United States. Mm. We fell in love with it from a standpoint 
It's a great place to raise kids. All my kids were younger in uh, elementary school at the time. And when we came and visited on our first interview, my wife and I, we fell in love with it. And uh, the school systems were fabulous. And I was given some autonomy to run the radiology department the way I wanted it. Okay, so, which is important. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. When I met with the CEO, you know, one thing that really got me, sold me on this place is, is he said, listen, it's your department. You run it the way you want it to. The only thing I ask is you don't let me get hit over the head without knowing it's coming. Sold me right there. Now, was that Mr. West? No, that was actually Chip Holmes, who was the CEO okay. at that time. Okay. Um, he's now with QHR up in Maine. But when he said that, I said, that's what I'm looking for. Let, let me run the boat. Let me do what I know is right, and you won't be sorry. And that's all you can ask for is give me an opportunity, and, and he gave me that opportunity. Okay, great. Um, so give us a quick comparison between Rutland Regional and Littleton Regional, kind of beds, service lines, satellite clinics, and so forth. How does, and, and follow on to that, how does Littleton's location affect the operation of the hospital? Sure, so, so Rutland, Rutland was, uh, is much larger than Littleton. Rutland uh, was, like I said, I think 170 beds. Littleton is a critical access hospital, which by terms means it's a 25-bed hospital inpatient unit. We actually have quite a robust outpatient service here at Littleton. We do do less exams than Rutland did, but busy for our community at least. We're a smaller community than Rutland, but here again, we, we have a thriving thriving organization here. Okay. You have a, a fairly robust set of services. We walked around the hospital earlier and we were looking at all the outpatient activity that you have here. Yep. So first first question here is, is, does Littleton employ its providers? What's the relationship between the providers that are working here and, and the hospital? Right, so we do employ a fair amount of our providers, but we also have providers we don't employ. I think something that our current CEO, Mr. West, has been very open to is that when we're recruiting a provider or a subspecialty, we're open to anything that that provider might want. So do they want to be an employee of the hospital? Do they want to be out on their own? Or would they like some mismatch of, of that uh, agreement? Um, we're open to anything. Um, I think that's just about you know recruitment, getting the right specialties in here for our area, and, and partnering with physicians so that it's a win-win for, for, for the hospital organization and the phys physician. So, so yeah, so we do employ quite a bit of them. We do have physicians that we don't employ. But I think uh, overall, we have a great partnership with our employed physicians and our non-employed physicians. Okay. What is the trend that you see in terms of the relationship between physicians and hospitals and employment or not employment? Yeah, I think more and more physicians are asking to be employed by organizations. Um, I think physicians go to school because they want to treat patients and help people. They're not necessarily business managers and, and they don't want the headaches of running a practice having to deal with billing, management, that kind of stuff. It, the regulations are more and more and more burdensome. And what I've found in talking to physicians is they didn't go to school to be a manager. You know, they went to school to treat patients. And they'd much rather have somebody else do the management of their practice for them as long as they can see patients. So I think that's the trend in uh, healthcare now is more and more employed physicians. Okay. Um, what is the most robust practices you have here? I would tell you our most robust practice is orthopedics. We have a, a very strong orthopedic service line up here. They do amazing work. We attract a lot of patients from all over New Hampshire and Vermont who come here specifically for orthopedic care. Really? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really robust service line for us. We also have, at least within the North Country here, um, urology. We attract a lot of patients because of urology here. And we have several other neurology. We're, we're one of the only hospitals up here in the North Country um, that offers neurology. So I think we've taken a look at saying, if we can get the specialists here and get people into our hospital and see what nice facility we have, maybe they'll come back. So we've, we've really done a, a really, I think, good job at recruiting specialists that are right for our organization and area. Okay. And you, uh, we talked earlier while we were walking around that you actually have OB, which is something that a lot of smaller hospitals have decided they don't want to continue doing. But yeah. you guys have made that decision to, to continue to have OB practice here. Totally. So the, the more and more small community hospitals just can't afford OB practice anymore. It, it, it loses money for an organization. We've taken the tact here to keep our OB departments open and actually expand them um, because we truly believe that women in the family make the health their healthcare decisions for their family. And if we can get them in the door to see what a beautiful facility we have and what great care we're gonna give them, 
hopefully they'll make the decision to bring their family back and receive care here. So even though, listen, it, it, it loses money for us as well, we've made that decision that it's an important enough service to continue on and, and hopefully those families come back for more care with our organization. Okay. So you came here initially as the Director of Diagnostic Imaging Services and you continued in that role and actually you were telling me you're actually technically still in that role. Yes, sir. But it seems, it seems uh, as we say in the Army, that someone started adding rocks to your rucksack, which, by which I mean uh, you progressively added additional responsibilities over the next 10 years. And, and I'm looking at kind of the list of, of things. You, you started out as the Director of Diagnostic Imaging Services in 2005. You became, also became the Director of Cardiopulmonary Services in 2009. You became the Physician Practice Manager for the Radiology Practice in 10. Physician Practice Manager for Pain Management in 11. Uh, you added the Practice Management for Pulmonology and Sleep Medicine. And at 13, you became the Practice Manager and Liaison for Orthopedics. So how did all that happen? I kept raising my hand. Okay. <laughs> so that seems like a theme in your career. Yeah. So, um, well, within healthcare nowadays, you know, our margins are so, so small. It's about doing more with less. And okay. that's just the realization of it. I think somebody, some of my superiors and mentors, saw something within me that uh, said, hey, you know, Rob, Rob can do more. They asked, I would say yes. Yeah, absolutely. Give me more. I want to learn. Was that something that, that you had? I mean, like uh, you went, you were, you were, I assume, fairly comfortable at that point with imaging services. Yeah, so yeah. You came in, you were the director of imaging services, but you, didn't, you hadn't worked cardiopulmonary. True, right? true statement. Right? Knew nothing about it. Okay. But here again, it's about leading people. Yeah. It's about having good people underneath you who you can trust and know that they're going to do the right thing and lead them in the right direction and mentor them. So uh, I give a lot of my success to the people underneath me. Um, I have good people that work for me and, and, and you got to get the right people in place who you can trust and know they're, they're going to do the right thing too. So really it's about just giving them some direction. As I took on more and more roles and I kept raising my hand, yeah, I'll do that, yeah, I'll do that. You know, we have, I have some really great people that work for me, and uh, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't have those people because it's just about giving them a little bit of direction and saying, hey, here's where we're going. Let's all get in, going in the same direction. Let's row the boat the same way, yeah. you know, or let's all get on the bus and head the same direction. And, you know, I, it was not a hard leap for me because really it's about managing people. Did I need to know everything I needed to know about cardiology? I've learned a ton um, since I took over. But it's really about having good people underneath you that uh, just need a little direction. And here again, I give them the autonomy like I was given to say, hey, do the right thing. If you do the right thing for the patient, you're probably not going to be wrong. So go at it. Do Is that job. an important part of your leadership style, this embrace of autonomy? For I think your, so. For I think so. If you have the right people working for you and, you know, there's, there's a trust that comes with that. And that's built up over time. But absolutely, I, I totally believe in part of a good leader Leader is giving some autonomy to your people to do the right thing. Doesn't mean people don't make mistakes. People do make mistakes. We're all human. But then that's part of the mentoring aspect is you bring them in and say, hey, this is not maybe the way I would have done that. Let's learn from it. Here's what I would have done. Maybe that's still not the right thing, but let's both learn from this issue. I think it's normal in a, in a career, whether it's in healthcare or other fields, where you, as a manager you start moving up, eventually you're going to move out of an area where you where you have high levels of technical competence. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you're going to have to start engaging with fields that you are not an expert in, and you will never be an expert in if you want to keep moving up right. in management. Yep. So, what advice would you give to people who are kind of ready to make that jump? How how you talked about you know giving people autonomy, and so forth. But what did you do? So the day one that you were handed cardiopulmonary or you became the physician practice manager, how did you start approaching that saying, I'm never going to be the expert? Right. So how, how did you deal with that? Right. I think, uh, so anytime I've ever taken over a, a different service line, up till today even, um, if I'm given another challenge, I go meet with that whole team. I'll meet with the manager first or the director, kind of give them my outlook on life and healthcare. But I also meet with their whole team. You know, I have departments that have 40 people in them and I pull them all together and I, I have my talk with them. And my talk kind of goes something like this. I'm a strong believer in integrity. 
I mean, integrity to me means you do the right thing and you do the right thing even when nobody's looking. And the other thing is, as I tell them, I will always be honest with them, no matter what. As part of that commitment that I'm making to, to my employees, to be honest, they also have to realize that I'm in a position I'm going to know some things that they can't know. And they have to be able to take the words, I may know, but I can't tell you. Or that's an area we can't go. So that's kind of my talk to my employees, every single one of my employees, is that I truly believe in integrity and I will always be honest with you. And if I think you can start from that point as a leader, a lot of things come easy because the book's open. So from that standpoint, if, if you can make that commitment between two people or, or me and my team of individuals, it's a good starting spot. Okay. Yeah. So you're not the, you, in 2005, you were not the expert in cardiopulmonary and, and, and right. so forth. How do you start, you know, you're, we're talking about leadership. So how do you set the direction for a, for a organization where you're not the expert in the field? I think you rely on your people and I think you go spend time with your people. Definitely not, not an expert by no means with cardiopulmonary or, or any of the service lines I have right now, but you go spend time with your people. I spent hours and hours and hours and days upon days upon days just sitting in cardiac lab observing and seeing what they did on a daily basis. I think part, part, part of the thing that's made me successful in my role of today is that I came from a clinical background. Okay. So, you know, for lack of a better term, I have some street cred, you right, know? Right, right. Which know, a lot of administrators do not have. They, like, they like don't. Myself. I, they don't. I, don't, I don't think necessarily you have to, but I, I think you do need to keep an open mind and say, listen, I don't know everything. I'm never going to know as much as you, and that's okay. You know, I'm here to help you. It's about some servant leadership. Okay. You know, I'm here to help you. You know, you come to me when you got a problem. You come to me when you need some direction. We can talk about anything, whether it's work-related or in your personal life. You need some help. That's what I'm here for. So I, I think it's about getting to know your people, getting to know what they do, knowing that you're not ever going to be the expert. But you know what? In the end, we all put our pants on the same way. Right. And what are we here for? We're here to take care of patients. And if we can start from that perspective to say we're here to take great care of patients, we're really starting off on a good foot. And, and, and things after that, they get easier. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you've been successful um, because the leadership kept recognizing that, hey, Robert's doing something right yep. because they kept adding those ruck, those rocks to your rucksack. Right. Um, but as you add these kinds of additional responsibilities, mm -hmm. you can't spend the same kind of time with each individual organization, right? And this is something that managers, as they rise in responsibility, right. it's great to get boots on the ground whenever you can, but as you have a larger scope, there's more ground to put your boots on. And so how did you make the adjustment to that? That, that's the hardest thing, to be honest with you. When, when you move up in an organization, the hardest thing to learn is that you can't be every place at once, you know, and you can't spend as much time as you would like to because there's just the overwhelming amount of work you have to do and, you know, you have to spend time with everybody. Listen, personally, as I think about it, do I miss, miss spending some time in radiology because that's my comfort zone? Absolutely, I do. If I'm going to be honest about it, absolutely I do. But hopefully I'm, I'm helping other people and other departments and, and my other employees. Something I do on a daily basis, I did it today before you, you came in. I, every day, I go around on every single one of my departments. Get my cup of coffee and I'm off on the streets. And that means I round on every one of my departments, meeting with the individuals that are in that department on the day and my manager saying, hey, what's going on today? Is there anything I can help you with? Get in a conversation, 10, 15 minutes. It lets them know you're there for them. And then you move to the next department. So, so even though I've lost some time, as as you've take as somebody takes on more and more responsibility, you lose the ability to spend four hours in a department. You're just spending that time differently with different people. Um, so it's something I truly believe in. Is is every morning, 9 a.m. I'm out on the streets, rounding on my people. Okay. One of the things you've said a couple of times is it's important to have the right people. Yes. How do you know when you've that you've got the right people. So you take over a new organization. How do you know you've got the right people? It, it takes what time. What are you looking for? It takes time. I, I'm a strong believer in integrity and honesty. Those, those, that's what I'm really looking for. I think there's a, there's a groundswell within the recruitment worlds now to say, hire for your culture. You know, I can teach you the, the, the technical aspects of it, 
but hire the right person for your culture. So how do I know if I have the right person? It takes time. It takes time in observing them and seeing how they're treating their employees, see how they're dealing with administration. Are, do they have a sense of integrity? Are they always being honest? Are they giving me a load of crap when they come in and talk to me? So I, it does take time. It does take time. And, and listen, there are people you find that are not right. And uh, uh, you need to move them out of, out of uh, leadership roles. Uh, maybe they're just not a good leader. Maybe they're a great employee, but maybe they're just not a good leader. So not everybody can be a great leader, and, and, and that's okay. Uh, the world needs uh, Indians as well as chiefs, right? But I think that's about having an on, honest conversation with somebody. That's got to be a hard conversation it, to have. It, it can be a hard conversation, but I think as long as you come at it from a, a mutual respect point and you're being honest with the person, I think that's important. So not everybody is a great leader. That's okay. But I think it just, uh, finding the right leaders within an organization, it takes time getting comfortable and trusting that person so that you can say, hey, here's the job at hand, go do it. And you have confidence and you trust that person that they're gonna get the job done. Yeah, okay. So in 2013, you were promoted to be the executive director for operations at Littleton. What is the scope of this position? What activities do you oversee? And let's leave it at that. So I, uh, I really oversee all the ancillary services. So that's, um, I still oversee x-ray, cardiac, the additional responsibilities, physical therapy, facilities management, housekeeping, pharmacy, uh, food nutrition, uh, and there's probably a couple I'm leaving off. But so really all the ancillary departments, excluding nursing, um, because they're run by the chief nursing officer, um, that really make this organization run. So yeah, that's that's kind of the scope of my work now. Okay. So a lot so, more employees. So so I manage uh, overall probably somewhere in the range of 120 employees to 150 employees. We have generally within our organization about 450 to 500 employees. Well, so okay. all right. So um, how does your role now mesh with the other senior leaders in the organization? You mentioned a chief nurse. Yes. Where do you kind of, how do you all fit together? So we have a, uh, we have a really great senior leadership team here at Littleton. So my boss, Warren West, who's the CEO, um, is over several senior managers. So there's a CNO, um, there's the executive director of operations, there's a CFO, chief financial officer. We have the director of community relations um, on the senior management team. The director of HR is on the senior management team, and then there's a senior executive director of physician practices on the senior management team. Okay. So we all have our little piece of the puzzle that we do. Uh, CNO oversees nursing, of course. I oversee the ancillary departments. Um, the CFO oversees all the finances of the department, of the financial department, so patient financial services, um, the finance department, health information technology, and then the executive director of physician practices oversees all the physician practices. So we meet several times a week. Just to kind of hear again, we get our directions from the CEO. We walk out of the room in lockstep, <clears throat> push that down to the organization. Great. Yeah. And are you all then equals? Is this, a, is this a team of equals kind of direct reports? Yeah, so I, I would say yes, we are a team of equals. No, nobody's more important than another. Um, and that comes back to we all put our pants on the same way. Sure. You know, we have different levels of responsibility within the organization. But within our senior management group, there is a free-flowing uh, set of ideas that come out. Um, we are expected to speak our mind within our meetings and give our take on certain situations or whatever the uh, topic of the day is. Um, within, that, within that meeting or that group, we are free to say whatever we want. But when we walk out of the room, we're one team. And uh, whether we, uh, we just had a, a good argument over something, we come up with a decision. And when we walk out of that room, we're all, we're all supportive of that decision. So yeah, we have a really great group of senior managers here. Great. So you are no longer the physician practice manager for for those physician practices. True statement. Okay. So so when I took the position back in 2013, um, they actually split the chief operating officer position into two because when the chief operating officer came uh, several years ago, we actually only employed a couple physicians back then. But in our previous you know discussion, the trend is for more and more physicians to want to be employed by the hospital. So they decided to split the chief operating officer into two positions, which was the operations and the physician practice side. So um, although I do still, you know, it's hard to give up things, um, I still deal with the orthopedic practice. 
So, so that's still under my auspices. Um, all the other physician practices are under uh, the uh, director of physician practices. But you picked up things like logistics and nutrition care. And... I did. Yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's talk again a little more about leadership. How has your leadership style changed over the years as a result of your experiences, and in particular to accommodate the additional scope? Um, so how has my leadership changed over the years? I think it's funny. I think I think uh, some of that comes with age. I think when I came out of the Marine Corps, listen, you were a this is the way you do it. Right. Go do it. Right. Very directive. Um, very directive. Yeah. I, I think I think over over uh, over time, you understand that you know you need to give your your people the people that report to me some autonomy and some general guidance about my expectations and then let them go do their job. So it's about, I've become much more of a servant leader, right? That, uh, you know, it's not a top down approach. It's a, it's a bottom up approach. So, so as you look at a triangle, I should be at the bottom. I should be trying to help everybody else perform to their max potential, right? So it's really more about instead of, you know, back when I was younger and in the Marines, more directive. Now it's more about listening, you know, and what can I help you with? So I would tell you that's the biggest change that I've had in my my leadership career is is becoming more of a servant leader and, and listening and trying to, to to prop my folks up, you know, to do the best job they can instead of me directing down, they should be directing down to me and saying, Hey, I need this to get do my job better. And me listening and saying, Yeah, let's make that happen. Yeah. Or giving them a reason to say, Well, I, I, we can't do that now and this is why. You know, whether there's financial constraints or whatever, but but I, th- I think I've become a much better listener over my, my career. You've mentioned servant leadership a couple of times. Yes. Um, that's a book, yep. um, Servant Leadership. Yes, it is. Uh, so you're, I, uh, I assume you've read it. You're yeah, f- I have. You're a fan of it then? Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. I, I, can, you, you know, can you summarize kind of what this, this philosophy is? Boy, I, I think just the philosophy is that, is that as, as a leader, you are there to help your people. I mean, achieve their maximum potential. Within the healthcare world, you know, what's our number one job? We're here to take outstanding care of patients, right? And I should be there to help my people achieve that every single time, every day, every hour, every minute, every second. So my job as a leader within our organization is to help my people achieve that goal of taking great care of patients. So it's not me dictating down to them. It's me being at the bottom helping them. You know, they should be driving things down to me that I can help them with. That's, that's how I see servant leadership. Yeah, yeah. Can you give an example of, of a leader that you worked with who kind of demonstrated that to you, maybe helped you see, hey, this is, I need to be more like him or her? Yeah, I think, I think when I came here, uh, part of the thing that I, I told you uh, that attracted me to the job was, was Mr. Holmes, who was the CEO at that time. Um, you know, the thing that really sold me was he said, listen, the radiology department is your department. You go run it. Just don't let me get hit over the head. I trust you. That's all I needed to hear. You know, right. listen, somebody was going to give me the opportunity and they were going to trust me to do the job. Listen, there ain't nothing better than that. Right. You know, and I've tried to, to portray that to my managers now to say, listen, I trust you. Here's the direction we're going. Get the job done. Hands off. You come to me when you need issues or you need something solved. But you know what? I trust you to do the job that I'm laying for you. Go get it done. Can you give an example of a difficult leadership lesson uh, that you might have had to learn the hard way? <laughs> uh, what, what did you learn from it? Yeah. So there was a, this was back when I was only the radiology director. I might have been in charge of cardiopulmonary at that time. Um, there, <laughs> there was a situation where I was down having lunch one day. <clears throat> And there was a code blue uh, pediatric uh, called within the x-ray department. Now, code blue is uh, basically a cardiac arrest within the hospital. And it was in my department. So I flipped out right away. I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on up in x-ray? So I ran from the lunchroom to the x-ray department, totally out of breath. I run in the room, ready to help. And there they are uh, doing CPR on a mannequin. (laughs) I lost it. (laughs) I totally flipped out. I used a lot of profanity words because here again, my adrenaline was pumping <clears throat> and I had no idea they were going to do a, a mock code blue drill within my department. <clears throat> what did I learn from that? Um, one, keep your cool, have some tact. Um, I had always prided myself on having tact and, and coming across professional, 
that day I lost it. Because my thought was, how can you do this within one of my departments? With one, letting me know, and two, so that I could control the chaos that was going to happen, you know, within my department. Um, that was where my head was at. Retrospectively, I can say I understood what they were trying to do was, was you know, you have to do cold blue drills, right? So you know everyone's going to show up. They know where the rooms are at. I shouldn't have flew off the handle at this one particular person who was running the code blue drill. I subsequently apologized because I saw the errors in my way. And actually, I will tell you after that conversation of me going to her and saying, man, I'm really sorry about, you know, flying off the handle at you. Uh, I said some inappropriate things, totally apologized. I was out of line. Um, we actually became very good friends uh, after that. Uh, I think it actually our, it helped our relationship because I was willing to uh, admit that I had made a mistake, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's huge because as a human being, um, as much as, as we think, uh, you know, we're perfect and, and, and everything we do is great, we do make mistakes. So it, it kind of taught me a lesson that one, don't fly off the handle and two, admit when you make a mistake because, you know, usually on the, on the end, uh, good things come of that. And, and me and this, this other person, um, uh, it broke down some some uh, barriers that were within our relationship, and we actually had a much better relationship after I actually went and apologized and said, "Hey, I was in the wrong." So, nice. yeah, good. good lesson learned. Yeah, um, can you give me an example of a leadership challenge that you're particularly proud of having met? Boy, a challenge I'm proud of. Uh, there's a lot I'm proud of. Um, um, I think that uh, you know in my current position today. Um, I would tell you I'm 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 not one to take the credit for things, um, so that's kind of hard for me. But I am proud of the work that all of my people do. Um, um, I think they are extremely hardworking, from the environmental staff to um, the pharmacists, you know, to some of the physicians I have. We really do great work here. I don't take the credit for that, you know. I they they, they get the credit for that because they're the ones doing the work on the front lines. You know, I'm only here to, to, to help them out in times of need and to give them a little bit of direction. But besides that, they're the ones doing the hard work. So to sit there and say there's something I'm proud of, I, I'm proud of my people because they do amazing things on a daily basis that they, they don't even realize sometimes. And uh, that's part of our job, too, is to say, you were amazing today because it is something just out of the blue for them that they, you know, they wouldn't even think about. You know, as far as somebody going out and one of my facilities guys going out and giving a jump start to a dead car, you know, in, in the middle of winter, you know, when it's 30 below up here. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, just it's not even think about it. Say, oh, yeah, I'll come give you a jump, you know, or from simply um, helping a patient get up the hallway. So they do amazing things every day. And that's what I'm a proud of is, is that my people do amazing things on a daily basis. And it's just common hat for them. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned organizational culture and hiring for hiring for your culture. Yes. What is organizational culture and why is it important? <clears throat> I, I think each organization uh, has a culture that, that they want to portray um, within their four walls. I think our, organi our organizational culture here at Littleton is around helping, around having some integrity, and treating each patient, and, and our CEO says this, treat each patient like they were your mother. Here, and how would you want your mother to be treated? You know, and if you can keep that in your head and do what you would want for your mother, we're in a pretty good spot. So I think it's about being open and honest with people. I think that's what we try and portray as our culture here. And we try and hire people who are honest and open, willing to change at times. And here again, treat each patient like they were your mother. And would you want the best care for your mom? Absolutely. So. That person in that bed is somebody's mother, you know, yeah. or somebody's father. Treat them just like they were your own mother or father. And we're going to be in a pretty good spot. How do you think leaders go about shaping organizational culture? What does it take to, to get the kind of culture you want? So I think you got to live it. Leader. you got to live it. Okay. Um, it can't just be a set of words we say. It can't yeah. just be us uh, pumping out the mission and vision statement, right? Um, as a leader, you have to live, live that. You have to live your culture. You have, to, you, you have to go out there and, and be willing to show it. I round on patients every day. Um, Which means you actually go and talk to the I patients. I do, absolutely. I, every day I try in whatever department I'm in, if there's a patient sitting there, whether it's in the lab waiting to get blood drawn, 
in the x-ray department getting an x-ray or I'm down on the nursing floor and somebody's laying in a bed watching TV, I may just walk in and say, hey, how are we treating you today? Is everything going okay? Is there anything we can help you with? Any questions? So as a leader and something I expect of our leaders is, is that you live that culture. You know, it just can't be a set of words that you're, you're spewing out there. It's not do as I say, it's do as I do. And uh, if we as leaders aren't willing to live that, how do we expect our employees to live and uh, live that? So here again, I do that on a daily basis and uh, I let my staff see that. So if they see me doing it, they sure the heck can do it too. That's great. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about mentorship earlier. You said you had a, a great partnership with your wife and she's yep. been very encouraging yep. to you. Do you have any, any mentors since you've been here at Littleton or? prior to prior yeah. to coming through yeah I think uh, I, I would tell you I, I, I look at uh, mr. West who's the CEO of this organization as a, as a really great mentor he's he's pushed me forward in my career he's challenged me appropriately on things he is he has driven me to a level to the position I'm at now I mean uh, even though he'll tell you my god I can't believe I hired him for the job I think he really really <laughs> you know uh, him and I have a great relationship um, and, and if he's not teasing me, I know he's really mad at me. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. you know, he's pushed me to, to take on more and more responsibility within the organization. And he's he really believes in servant leadership and, and treating patients as if they were your mother or father. So I, th I think he's mentored. I think part of being a good mentor, too, is being honest with people. You know, and even if you got something bad to say um, or, or I didn't do something right, um, He'll come to me and say, hey, this is not the way I would have handled this. And, uh, or, or listen, uh, you didn't do that right. And that's part of being a mentor is being able to have that honest communication with somebody to say, yeah, this didn't go quite as you might have wanted. And, uh, uh, or you screwed up. Listen, we all screw up, right? And somebody's got to be willing to tell you, you screwed up. So from a mentorship standpoint, um, I would tell you he's he's mentored me quite a bit, and I actually roll that down to my people because we we need to be able to tell our leaders, hey, you screwed up. Here's how we fix it. Going forward, this is what I would do. Um, I had one of those conversations today. Yeah. So yeah, okay. but that's about being honest. Yeah. So those are hard conversations to have. They are hard conversations, you, but they're necessary. How do you get into that? They're necessary conversations. Yeah. Here again, as you develop trust and a relationship with 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 the people who report to you. Listen, we do not operate, and I do not, and I don't believe our organization is, is not a, a heavy-handed disciplinary organization, right? We understand people mess up. We're human beings. We're not infallible, and we're not perfect. We make mistakes. You're not going to get fired for a mistake. But let's learn from your mistake. Let's have a discussion about it, and then let's move forward so hopefully the mistake doesn't happen again. And you know what? If you make the mistake again... We'll have another conversation about it. And we'll try and fix it then. It's not about writing people up or terminating people because you make a mistake. It's about getting people to go where you want them to and doing the right thing. And here again, come back to the point. We're here to provide great patient care, right? If you start with that premise, which means something that something I, I, I learned in the Marine Corps, right? And, and you probably know this as well, being in the Army. There's really two, two, two goals as a leader. There's, there's mission accomplishment, and then there's troop welfare, right in that order. They don't change, right? So, so what's our mission? Taking great care of patients, right? The second one is you take care of your people. And if you take care of your people, they're going to provide great people care, uh, patient care. So, you know, the, I always come back to those two things. It's mission accomplishment and it's troop welfare. Um, so I totally believe in that concept. So I think if you take good care of your people, they'll take great care of patients. So you got to be able to have honest conversations with people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's shift gears a bit and, sure. and talk about professional organizations, which is part of why uh, we're, we're actually having this conversation today. Yeah. And, and that is you are the New Hampshire Regent for the American College of Healthcare Executives. What is that position? And, well, let's, let's actually, let me back that up. What is the American College of Healthcare Executives and how did you get involved in ACAG? So the American College of Healthcare Executives is an organization that is there to promote healthcare executives, okay. really. It's about networking, it's about education, it's about career management, it, it's about making sure that healthcare executives and people within leadership roles within the healthcare realm are doing the right thing, getting educated, staying on top of things, 
and doing a good job, really. They have a set of uh, ethical standards, as most organizations do. Um, they expect you to live by those ethics, you know, which is really, you know, ethics is about doing the right thing. Right. I got involved as uh, my previous boss kind of recruited me to get into the American College of Healthcare Executives. He was the New Hampshire regent at the time when, when he said, hey, I think this organization might be good for you. I know you're trying to move up your career ladder. I think this would be really interesting for you to get involved in. They're great educational and networking opportunities. So I became a member back in, I believe, 2010. And let me um, pause you for a second. That yeah. was Peter Wright who has previously been on The Forge. It's That's a, right, yeah, so Peter and... Peter was, was my previous boss here. Okay. So he so. was the New Hampshire regent, so I got involved. I was doing my master's program at that time too. So when he was getting ready to exit as his three-year term as the regent, um, he recruited me to run for the New Hampshire regent, which I did. I was elected by the New Hampshire members, and that's how I kind of became the regent. So what does the regent do? Well, I think the regent is there for our New Hampshire members as a sounding board and a conduit to the National American College of Healthcare Executives. So they drive some policy, education, what, does, what, you know, what do we want the National Congress to be looking at for us. So, so I'm kind of that conduit. Uh, I reach out to the members, they email me, I get phone calls from them saying, hey, I'm really interested in this. Could you bring this back? Or how do I do this? Or, you know, and, and here again, it's about mentoring some people. I get plenty of emails going, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Or maybe I'm thinking about going down this road to, uh, to just, just some like policy career things. People yeah, ask career, career, career advice. advice. Career advice, you know, how do, how do I get to a, a senior management level? Which then I can point them to the podcast. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But it's that kind of stuff. So, so the ACHE is really about you know networking, world class education, career management, and, and a set of ethics that kind of guide our principles of how how healthcare executives should act and, and treat people. Okay. How has your personal experience with ACHE uh, influenced your career and your career progression? Uh, I would say it's made me get out of my shell and think about healthcare more globally. You know, healthcare just isn't about what happens here in Littleton, New Hampshire. Healthcare is about what's happening in the state, as well as what's happening nationally, and to some respects, what's ha happening globally with healthcare. So it's made me get out of that, hey, what's happening at Littleton mode, to really what's happening in our state. You know, there's there's a lot of issues in healthcare. You know, reimbursements are declining. A lot of us operate on very small margins, if any margins at all. You know, so it, it, it's made me take a look at where is healthcare going in the future. Why should people get involved in ACHE, and in particular, young folks early in their career? Why should, for example, students in, in HMP, my program down at UNH, uh, be joining as students and, and trying to get involved? I think first, first, first and foremost, for, for your students, it, there's great networking opportunities there. You know, so, so much of after they graduate and graduate and getting a job in the healthcare field is about knowing people. It's about, listen, you're a great student, you're a 4 student, but boy, you need an in someplace. There, we get hundreds and hundreds of resumes, you know, so what's the differentiator there? Sometimes the differentiator is, hey, I know this person, I can call this person, say, hey, I just applied for this job, put in a good word for me, or can I put you down as a reference? You know, because inevitably, um, even though we get hundreds and hundreds of resumes, the healthcare world is a small community, right? right? There's a lot of people just since I've been in the ACHE that I know now. And I, I've actually, uh, I'm helping uh, one of my members. She's applying for a job and she said, hey, I don't know anybody here. Do you know somebody here? Absolutely, I do. I'll, I'll call that person and let them know you. You know, there needs to be a differentiator within within when you put in a resume or an application um, because just the volume is, is so much in healthcare nowadays as people are looking through resumes you know, what's the differentiator there to get you a job? And sometimes that just comes down to meeting people and networking with them. And yeah. some so somebody saying, hey, I remember I remember that person. You know, yeah, she was really good. I looked at her presentation at, at, at the chapter board meeting. It was fantastic. You know, she's really great. I think she might be good for this position. There's world-class education, the ACHE. The, the seminars I've been to, unbelievable and usually a lot of the education comes from people within our field who have an expertise so it's 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 the education is fabulous and, and it, it's real world it's not something you heard 20 years ago you know it's about what's happening in an organization today and this is what we did to, to address this issue 
And then they have career management services, which is really great. So, you know, part of, uh, you know, if, if uh, the students uh, ever get a chance to go out to Congress in Chicago, they actually have executives sit down and do resume reviews with people and say, you know, oh, you might want to change this or this resume is great. So there's just a lot of things that I, I think the college uh, offers, um, especially to students. And, and I would tell you the number one thing would be networking, though. Yeah. Yeah. And finding that first job first. You got to listen, you yeah. got to get in somewhere, Right. right? You know, I know your your goal, and 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 I'm sure my goal is. Listen, somebody graduates with with a, you know, a health degree, they shouldn't be working at McDonald's. Let's get them into the healthcare field, you know, because because we need new leaders. You and I are not getting any younger, so we need we need up and comers who really want to you know do great things for people. So that's what I would say. All right. Well, so in closing, let me ask you, um, what advice? do you have for someone thinking about going into healthcare administration today, whether they are coming straight into the field from a program like HMP where I teach, or maybe they're trying to make a shift into the field like you did. What education should they pursue? What jobs? Yep. Um, the first thing I'd say, it's not easy. It, it's not an easy field to be in. Um, if you want something challenging, but equally rewarding, um, it's a field for you. Um, Listen, you're going to, coming out of college, you're going to start on a lower rung. Keep raising your hand and saying, yes, yes, I'll take on that responsibility. Yes, I'd love to do that. Um, the more you say yes, the more you move up. You know, I would ask people, you know, are, you, are they prepared to be servant leaders? Are they, are they prepared to put their pants on the same way as everybody else? It's, it's not about management from the top down. It's, it's the inverse. Do they have the burning desire to help people? You know, I think that's what I found, you know, when I got into healthcare. I would have never thought I had that, but I, I found, wow, this is really great. You know, I can make a difference. You know, do they have that I, I want to make a difference attitude? And then start small. The, the first step is getting into an organization. So don't think you're going to come out of school and you're going to be the CEO. You know, start small. You know, you have to get into some place that's willing to take a chance on you. And then show them that you've got the, the where for all to uh, do bigger and better things. So, you know, part of my thing is, is I didn't, uh, you know, when I did my master's, I didn't do an MHA, I did an MBA. Okay. Um, Why'd you make that choice? I, I thought, you know, listen, if anything ever changes and, and, and the way healthcare was going back then, you know, you know, I better be prepared for other things just in case you never know what's going to come around the corner, right? So uh, keep your mind open. There's a lot of jobs out there in healthcare. It's not just about hospitals. There's, there's, there's a ton of different jobs out there in healthcare. So, you know, keep your mind open. One last, let me follow up with one last question. Yeah. Um, and and it, it occurred to me as you were talking. You've worked at mid-sized, large bedded facilities. Yep. As well as a critical access hospital here. What's the benefit in terms of career development at being at each of those? And, and we were talking before we started the interview that a lot of my students go to places like Mass General, huge. Right. Children's, huge. Yep. These great big facilities. What would be? What would you sell a place like Littleton or 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 a smaller facility, uh, maybe a, a community hospital? Right. What would be the benefit of going there? Instead? Yeah, I think I think part of part of the draw to that that I've drawn to uh, smaller community hospitals is one you get to know everybody. Two, hospitals or or healthcare organizations. Uh, I think we talked about this earlier. It's do more with less. So I think the opportunities can almost be greater in a smaller hospital because they're always looking for somebody else to do something else. So uh, I go back to when I started my x-ray career, I went to a small 14-bed hospital to start with, um, which, uh, you know, right before Bradley, I only worked there for a little bit, but uh, it was a small hospital. I got to learn to do ultrasound and CAT scan because that's what you had to do to survive. So with a small community hospital, it's all about doing, uh, I hate to say doing more with less, but it's about who can do more and wants that opportunity. Right. So sometimes I think the opportunities are actually greater if you can show that, hey, I want to do more. You know, you just here again, I come back to you, you just got to keep raising your hand saying, yeah, I'd love to take that on. Um, because the more you show and people get to know you and trust you, the more they will put on your plate and you will move up, move up in the organization. So that's what I think about community hospitals. I think it's more of a family, family sense in a, in a smaller organization. I'm a big believer in and we take care of our family. Here and I think most of most of our leadership team believes that as well. You know that every member of our organization, the 450, 500 employees we have, are a member of our our Littleton Regional Healthcare family, 
and we would go above and beyond for those people. And I think by knowing those people personally uh, on a name basis um, gives you more opportunity and it makes you feel feel a sense of community and family. So that's great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you. All right. It's been my pleasure. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.